How do we get more guidance in the dream? And is desiring more guidance helpful or is it a trap? How do we get more guidance in the dream? It seems like it's always there. And so it can seem a, like a good question. How can, you, how can I get more? But actually it's more about um, watching the mind and really allowing the obstacles to be removed. Because the Holy Spirit speaks to us all through the day, it's just that, that really the question is how willing am I to hear what the guidance is. So it's like, it's like if you were under a stream of water and then you at times removed yourself from the stream, the stream would continue, uh, but you wouldn't get wet. If you stepped away from it, you wouldn't really be in the stream, you would, the stream would be continuing. So. So I think for myself, it was always a matter of um, really noticing my thoughts, watching when I noticed my emotions were, you know, upsetting in any way, and really stopping, pausing, and, and asking to see it differently. And um, sometimes I would just ask myself, what is it that I believe here? Or what, is, what am I holding on to here? Or what is it that, that is, is clouding my my mind at this moment that I would feel this way and in that sense it was kind of removing the obstacles with the Holy Spirit's help. I think that the whole idea of more can be a trap. In fact there's a section in the Course Beyond All Idols where Jesus starts it off by saying, what is an idol do you think you know? An idol is for more of something, it does not matter more of what. And so he's equating more with idolatry in that section. And as you go deeper with the Course or deeper into spirituality, the ego really can play that more card. Um, as if you're unfulfilled, you're lacking, you, you need to improve in many different ways, and one of those ways is to have more guidance instead of just pausing and, and really looking honestly, and I, am I willing to really listen? Am I willing to receive the answer that is given me? And if I'm not willing, uh, what are those obstacles? And that's very practical. So, um, what do you do when you're in a position where you realize that your willingness has become garbled, and um, but you have to make a decision now? Like... Uh, Somebody asks you to do something, and it causes conflict, and but the answer, is, the person's waiting on your answer. Um, you know, do you say, hold on, let me uh, go over here and work with this, or do you just come up with an answer and then go into the flow and just deal with it as you go, or what yeah. do you suggest? I think it would depend on where you were at in your mind training, but for most people, when they're, I'll say, more at the beginning of the mind training, uh, the mind, as Jesus says, your mind is much too tolerant of mind wandering, and so the mind is very untrained, and um, decisions are really continuous, he tells us in the Rules for Decision, but you're just not aware that you're making them. So, so there's a lot of clearing the mind, a lot of mind watching, a lot of attentiveness that has to come in. But I would say in more of the beginning stages of mind training that, yeah, to, to be able to just pause or say something as simple as, you know, can you give me a moment? I don't really feel uh, very tuned in right now, or I don't feel very willing to hear <laughs> my guidance right now, or I need to take a pause or a break. Because um, a lot of times when, when the mind is not trained, it's, it's very common for people to just kind of answer on the fly, uh, I'll do it, oh sure I'll do it, and then um, five, ten minutes, two hours, a day later, what did I do? Why, how could I have said yes to that, you know, and so forth. And then there's resentment, and then there's a feeling like, no I don't want to do it, and you can see that there's like aspects of the mind that kind of play out, you know, no I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it, no I don't have to do it, you know, the mind will try to convince itself of things. And that's pretty common when the mind's untrained. But um, then when you, it's almost like a timeout, 
you know, for children, you know, when they seem to be struggling or, or fighting or depressed or whatever. And I think that's pretty practical at the beginning stages of mind training as well. So I was talking to Eric this morning, and um, I got, definitely got some clarity on something. Let me see if I can uh, sort of phrase where I was having a problem. So um, I guess it has to do with the aspect of free will. So for example, when I was in Florida, and I decided to come to Utah, it was um, a decision, it wasn't, there was no voice, you know, audible voice or anything like that, something obvious talking to me, telling me to go. It was a series of, of thoughts and feelings associated with those thoughts and exploring my options and looking at the more um, sort of um, what my parents would have wanted me to do, which is stay in the town where they live. and and. Um, you know, just feeling, uh, looking at how I felt when I thought about the options. And noticing that I always came back to a, a feeling of inspiration when it came to the idea of coming out to Utah. And noticing that I had all these, um, I was putting up all these obstacles between me and just doing it. And when I started to question whether or not I really needed to go accomplish this before going to Utah and accomplish that before going to Utah, noticing that I was really not needing to do that at all. And so then it finally just kind of became clearer and clearer as, as I was doing this. So I wasn't joining with anybody per se. You know, I wasn't, I mean, my neighbors and my friends in that town are not on this program. Mm -hmm. um, so I was basically doing it alone. We could say I was doing it with the Holy Spirit. Um, so... Um, you know, so I could say I was doing this autonomously, I mean, in the sense that there was no body else. Um, and I kind of get the feeling that this is the way you were operating when you were, you know, doing on your own, or even though I know you were with people, but these people you were with were not necessarily well-trained minds in the beginning either, right? Mm -hmm. So you were yeah. all sort of in the same boat. Yeah. So you had to trust, you had to really just be vertical. Um, where did you get your discipline, if not, um, I mean, how did you self-impose a discipline, I guess it's... Well, I think um, it probably started to take root a bit in, in high school. I mean, I would say that, that um, if we just talk about discipline in general, um, as just an ability or skill, just like riding a bike or driving a car, um, having mental discipline, um, you know, that's something I think it started probably in junior high and high school when, you know, when I had to start to read all these things and memorize all these things and begin to take all these tests that are part of the educational system. It's a discipline to that. You know, I don't think, you know, I know when I was growing up before I was five, I, I don't think I was disciplining myself very much. Maybe my parents were attempting to <laughs> impose some there, but I don't think I would ever call that self-discipline there. It would be more imposed kind of discipline. And, and then I guess I was, I was somewhat inspired to learn, and maybe there was a part of a motivation there in school, in junior high and high school, to succeed and get good grades, and there probably was for approval and, and some other things that I would call ego motives, but there was definitely a motivation to learn there and to get good grades, um, you know, whatever the motivations underneath it were, and to do that, you know, it required, you know, reading and preparing and, and so forth, which I would say was more the beginnings for me of self-discipline, because there really wasn't, I don't think anybody, you know, my parents weren't over me cracking a whip or anything. It was more like I was motivated and inspired and I did that. And then when I went into university and then eventually into graduate school, oh, there was definitely a need for self-discipline there uh, in terms of studying and preparing. It just seemed to get more and more focused, almost like a beam 
of light that you focus more and more and more. And then when I kind of stepped out of uh, university and those academic pursuits, there was, I would say, a self-discipline that was already pretty well established there. Um, I didn't really know what that was for or how to apply it in a spiritual way, but I don't think any of us do. We're, you know, spirituality usually just comes upon us and we start asking questions and, and pondering and wondering and, you know, wondering where our, our life's direction is going and, and what's the whole meaning of life and what's the purpose of all this. Then we start to apply some of that discipline that maybe it was there before what to whatever, to graduate or to get good grades or to get a good job or whatever. We just apply it, you know, more in terms of um, self-inquiry maybe, you know, in, in kind of a natural way. So I think um, I would say that I started having kind of an awakening experience. I've talked about it before, like a tickle in my heart. And it was, seemed very important and and it seemed very joyful and very inspiring. And so I simply started to apply that self-discipline toward, toward the tickle, so to speak, toward the, the feeling of joy and inspiration. And then, um, when I started working with the Course, it just seems like everything accelerated. I mean, when I say accelerated, it just was like at an exponential rate where I could tell from studying the Course that uh, this was about mind training, this was about learning to hear the voice for God, you know, and really tune into Jesus, this is the way I thought of it, Jim Ray's Christian. And so I was thinking, wow, this is going to be some task, uh, you know, because of course there's, there's doubts about that, you know. But I really had a sense at the beginning, when I first started opening up and reading the Course, that this was kind of my escape, my way out of my judgments and my upsets and my difficulties and my challenges. And so when I got deeper and in, into it, I just put myself uh, to it. I took all the self-discipline I had and uh, it was mostly just pure inspiration at the beginning for like the first two and a half years. I talk about reading it, you know, eight hours a day on the average. Not consecutively, but you know, when I wasn't in resistance. <laughs> Uh, reading it, and, and I was very inspired underneath that. It just felt like, like this is, it felt very helpful to me. And because it felt so helpful, it was almost like if you use the analogy of the world where you, you get a dividend and they ask you if you want to reinvest the dividend or spend it. Uh, I was like always like reinvesting back into this kind of focus, you know, there was never a point where I thought, wow, this really has improved my life, now I'm just going to go back and do whatever. I just never thought that. I felt like I was just reinvesting uh, and, and it was building kind of in an exponential way um, and my heart was opening up, it felt experientially. And so uh, that really kind of took it from self-discipline in the sense of like a task or a chore, or a challenge, to an adventure, like, and I was just ad investing in that adventure, and reinvesting in that adventure, and then after about two and a half years, it was, it was just, the voice was speaking to me, very conversational, very clearly, very gently, and it was just so cool. I mean, it was, it just made everything so much easier. Instead of getting up in the beginning of the day trying to figure out what I was going to do, or like struggling with decisions, should I do this, should I do that, you know, the way the pros and cons and all the typical things that I had done before, that was like no longer necessary. It was just like it was being given, just given moment by moment, hour by hour, the days just, just were given, there was just instructions, there was, it was like a, an ongoing dialogue, oftentimes it feels like me asking questions and just being given a lot, and it made life a lot easier. 
Okay, so I'm I'm wanting now to just to figure out what the uh, I'm I'm wanting to see what sort of correlations there are between the way you experienced your growth into this guidance and trusting it, and the way the uh, mind training is set up at the monastery. So um, let me just tell you. Um, going to sort of ramble a little bit. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I studied the course for a long time with Ken Wapnick mm -hmm. and all that. And, you know, praise be, I really learned a lot. But I was looking for the next step because I saw that I was just sort of floundering and not, you know, on a, on a, on a pl I had plateaued and I wasn't getting anywhere, and I was going to all these groups. I mean, I'd gone to like, I don't know, 80 groups or so in the country, and and um, it just started to feel like I was on a hamster wheel, really. Much like life feels in the work world, and everything has yeah. just started to just feel the same. I'd like a Course in Miracles groupie, or a Course in Miracles <laughs> yes. junkie, <laughs> on the press junket. Right. Where's my next uh, group? <laughs> right, you know, like looking, I was always looking like for someone or something or some group or some dynamic or some place or something that was yeah. going to give me another, uh, just another piece of the puzzle to help me with this riddle of how to go about deepening this experience. And I wasn't finding it uh, until I started watching you regularly on YouTube. Um, it wasn't right away because... Um, you just seem like just like a, a very gentle, sweet, great guy, you know, like guy next door kind of, and which was very pleasant. But until I really started to listen to your words and really listen, did I think, okay, this guy actually has a lot going on. So yeah, that's um, the way it usually is. You <laughs> meet somebody at the diner. You have a piece of cherry pie. You have a great time, and then afterwards they go, "Wow, that was profound." <laughs> but but they just have a good time. <laughs> they just enjoy themselves. Yeah. And so um, anyway, I finally came to an experience where I realized, okay, this is definitely worth looking into. So then I got a few of your books or the books that are, were compiled of your writings, letter writing with people. And um, and then uh, when I went down to see you in Naples in May of this year, that was it. I mean, it, that was the clincher. So I just had uh, and still have a trust that I feel for uh, the way the direction your mind has gone with this. And um, so this pulled me out to Utah. This was part of my whole, okay, this is this is what's taken me out. So like if you were a beacon of light, I was going to just go where the light was, where the source was. So I got came out, but I wasn't really knowledgeable about what the setup was out here, you know, with mm -hmm. um, the messengers and the, the just the whole setup. Mm -hmm. So I walked in just blindly, not really knowing. The retreat was wonderful. And then... Um, with the, uh, the, in, the, the instructions given by the messengers, I found myself uh, feeling really conflicted about it. And when I would uh, talk about it, the general, you know, I'm the, of course I, I'm not claiming to be perfectly clear on what was going on, so. But the way I was interpreting it was, um, you just simply, uh, follow the instructions and however the resistance comes up is just what you have to work on it's showing you what you have to work on in terms of you know why you wouldn't why you would struggle and um, I was in conflict about this because I thought well but you know what about this something in me that says you know you know what to do based on uh, the options presented and how you feel as you contemplate the options well I wasn't necessarily feeling good and so to me that was like that was a no and um, so to be in a group now where it's about flowing with a group is something mm -hmm. to me very different than being on your own and having to develop a sense of vertical trust on your own never really on your own of course but you know not with obvious 
people who have stated their intent mm. to be one with yours. Very good. So if, um, if uh, say one of the messengers comes in and asks me to do something, okay, if I feel like I need to say yes in order to have peace, though I don't feel like I want to do it, so then I'm, I am, I am experiencing sacrifice. And if I say no because I don't want to do it, then I'm experiencing conflict because I'm feeling like no, like this, and I feel a conflict. Um, and I don't even know why I want to do it. I can come up with a hundred reasons why I don't like that, but those are not necessarily the reasons. So what's really going on is I have, um, I have failed to see the innocence of the person who is asking me to do this. Because if it were somebody whose innocence I saw completely, like I think of my best friend, Mm -hmm. back in Florida. Mm -hmm. She could step in and say, hey, Leslie, could you? And just fill in the blank. And because I love her so much, whatever she said, I'd probably just do it because I don't really care. I'm just joining with her. I'm just saying yes to her. And then I just, you know, it looks like yes to this, but it's not. It's yes to her. And then I just do this because why not? Mm -hmm. But since uh, this messenger's not her, I'm making a distinction between these people. And I'm saying, I don't know who you are. I don't trust you. And this, so this is really where the issue is. Is this correct? Yeah, I think the, the trust, the trust does have to deepen and generalize before we can really feel that loving experience with every everyone and everything. But what you're describing is very common, you know, where you have a best friend, and the reason they're your best friend is because there's a sense of love and connection and trust that's there and then it seems to be like it's limited in other areas with other people and so on and so forth and so it's it's kind of like the lighthouse the light sweeping around into the dark and transferring and generalizing so that you know you overall open up and become more trusting in general just and and even though there's, there's course workbook lessons like I trust my brother who is one with me you know, you go as you go deeper in the spiritual journey. You're you're really not in the end trusting in bodies, and the deeper you go into guidance, into into your intuitive flow, you're not really trusting in the five senses. So when the course lesson says, "I trust my brother who's one with me," you know, it tends to be people interpret that like, "Okay, now now I got to learn how to trust my brother," but if my brother is a body or my brother brother is male or female or whatever, or flesh, then as you go much, much deeper into the experience, you start to realize that it just is really tuning into this guidance, what's given you moment by moment by the Holy Spirit, is really what it's all about. But the Holy Spirit has to use what the ego made to bring the mind into that flow, into that guidance. And yeah, brothers and sisters is part of what the ego made, the world. It's part of what the ego made. Words are part of what the ego made, and the Holy Spirit has to use it all to, like, you know, retrain the mind and to help the mind let go of following this the ego guidance of being so dependent on the five senses. So it's pretty typical. Sometimes people will say, "Oh, I, I reacted to that, or this happened, and I reacted," and in the end, reactions are part of this kind of, it's almost like stimulus response, you know, like from B.F. Skinner in, in psychology, is if there's a world outside of you that's dictating how you feel, or there's things that do seem to happen to you, or even from you, that, that you have strong emotional reactions to. And what we're learning is that there's, you know, there's what seems to be going on, and then there's the interpretation of what seems to be going on. And you never react to the physical directly, you always react to the interpretations. That's why he says to learn this course requires willingness to question every value that you hold. Because if you're judging, if you're interpreting 
with the ego, your emotions, you know, will reflect that. You will be reacting to your interpretations. He even has a reference in there to the golden rule, you know, but it, it's, even though it's in there, he's saying basically it still depends on your perception of your brother and sister. You know, do unto others as you would have done unto you. It still depends on your perception because your emotions, you will react to those interpretations. So, in that sense, um, it's always good, no matter what the context is, um, if somebody's asking you to do something, you are mind-watching. You're paying attention to your thoughts, you're paying attention to your feelings. It wouldn't be a matter if somebody was doing it over a phone call, or sending you an email, or seems to be standing five feet away from you saying, I want you to do this. You know, you, you still have to watch your thoughts and watch your feelings, and that's where the, the mind training comes in, and that's where the clearing away, the debris of ego, uh, really takes place. And so, it's not a behavioral thing, it's not about, you know, being good or having behaviors that, that align up with what people tell you to do or anything like that. It, it, in that sense, it is a very intimate experience, because you're working with your mind 24-7. Uh, and even before you go to sleep at night, you know, really giving your mind over to the Holy Spirit and saying, you know, help me tonight, you know, be with me. Uh, really help me in my mind training. And uh, it takes it away from kind of a lot of what I call just the world leader, follower, following people, following rituals, uh, just doing things because they've been done for 20 years or hundreds of years without even questioning why am I doing this, you know, that doesn't make any sense to me. So for me, I think it, it, it is about, there's a, there's a key element of trust in there, and it's really joining in a purpose, having a shared purpose of undoing the ego, and then it all comes down to that trust. Um, even though the ego will try to pick things apart and go, I don't really feel like that today, or, you know, it can have a lot of resistances that come up, because it, it is autonomous, it, it wants a, a will of its own, it wants to have an autonomous will apart from God, that's what the ego is about, and this whole system of mind training with the Holy Spirit is designed to wash that away. And then it just seems to be that there are others that, that are on the same path, or that are doing the mind training as well. And um, so it's a lot of opportunity for, I call it discernment. Because um, it's not like a sense of, of a blind leader-follower thing. Um, if you were there in messengers meetings, you know, you would see somebody bring up an issue, and it may go round and round different interpretations of the issue, different feelings around the issue, uh, different announcements and declarations around the issue, like, I'm not doing that, no way, da 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 da, you know, it goes around and around, and, and that's where there has to be a trust in the Holy Spirit to be there, to take it deeper, because it doesn't, uh, nothing is resolved in, you go your way, I'll go mine, or, Sometimes I've heard some teachers use this thing, just agree to disagree. What is that? You know, where does that come in? How is that even practical? You know, if we have, if there's one Spirit guiding us, and we're using, the, letting the Spirit use the symbols of the world, but if we can pray, if we can be joined, if we can hear one voice, uh, and, and we can have that sense of recognition of life. Are you hearing what I'm hearing? Ah, yes. It's more of like a, a, a join, almost like a consensus feeling that we're in this together and we're hearing the same instructions together. That happens a lot. And progressively as you go on the spiritual journey, that just happens more and more and more. And it just washes away that sense of um, a autonomous uh, decision-making, or you go your way, I'll go mine, or we'll compromise, we'll do it your way this time, we'll do it my way next time. You know, that's, we just, I don't think we can settle for that. 
I don't care how natural and normal that seems in the world, it's just, uh, it, there's not a real sense of peace and love and joining and connectedness with, you know, agreeing to disagree or keeping it at the level of opinions, you know, or keeping it at the level of the personal perspective and personalities. It just doesn't bring peace. It doesn't bring uh, sustained peace at all. It's a halting to communication, right? It's like a block at saying we won't communicate. Yeah. We agree to disagree, meaning we're not going to communicate. Yeah. Almost like giving words to agreeing to not communicate. And what's what's that all about? <laughs> you know? So you never agree to disagree? Oh, it's never. never an option oh, no. in any, any interaction with no. anybody. No, but I've never, never, ever had that phrase come to mind or never the Spirit has never spoken that once. And even compromise, you know, it's, I, I don't go for compromise. I, I loved it when I read in the Course, salvation is no compromise of any kind. I thought, that's got to be a divine mind that's saying that. I haven't heard that one on this planet. It's all about compromise. If you want to have good relationships, you got to compromise. If you want to have good, you know, relationships at work, at church, at school, or whatever, you have to learn to compromise, and I just think, I think that's ridiculous. You know, uh, that's, to me, that's to try to settle. And uh, I don't think this is about settling, really. This is about peace of mind. So this brings me back to this topic I keep coming back around to, for me, mm -hmm. it's an issue for me, it's debt. Okay. Yeah. So I accumulated student loans. 20 years ago and um, it's been like a you know this this thing this ball and chain I've been dragging around with me and interestingly I could have paid it off recently because I had the money to do it but I didn't and when I looked at why I didn't it was because when I was at my last job I had saved this money and I didn't want to hand it over to the debt because the money I had saved was in exchange for what I considered to be quite a sacrifice. And so I wasn't going to let this go easily, this money. I was going to do with it what I wanted to do because now it's my turn. I sacrificed my time and now I'm going to do what I want to do. That's it. And so um, what I've been realizing while in this mind training program is that this mentality is actually uh, the metaphysical underpinnings of the debt. Um, like there's this thinking uh, that's really, the debt is just like a seeming physical reflection yes. of this inner process. So um, when I think about work, um, I think uh, bosses, you just have to say yes, you know, compromise, because that's what they're paying you for, you know, that kind of thing. And so in that kind of setup, it's very painful. Um, it doesn't feel right. And all this in exchange for the paycheck. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, when I think about doing what I need to do to pay off my debt, it involves some sort of money exchange somewhere. I mean, since the debt is represented in the form of money anyway. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, well, so... Perhaps what I'm being asked to do then, really, is to um, enter into a situation, a job, but really look at how I compromise and to have as a goal not to do that. Have as a goal, rather, to communicate, to connect. Um, but, you know, my ego mind says, this is not going to work. People don't want to do this. They just want you to do what they tell you to do. And if you are unwilling to just up and do it, then they're going to fire you. You're never, this is never going to work. Yeah. So what's really being asked of me is to trust that this does work and to move forward in it in this new way. Yeah. Yeah, I think your issue is an issue for many, many, many people on the planet. And um, it's, it's really good to explore that because it's like you were, you're on to the solution, I think, too, is that, that if you're willing to not compromise, if you're really 
willing to to say what you feel and and really become very intuitive and follow your heart that everything will be taken yeah. care of if you're willing to communicate then you will start to draw witnesses of that willingness to communicate that will come back to you and maybe that's part of what you're experiencing here or even particularly at the, the week retreat that you talked about you know where there was this willingness to communicate the participants came from all over the place in Korea and came here and just there was this openness this willingness to communicate and then these reflections back that it's safe to communicate that that the, there's nothing being taken away from you through the communications and nothing really being asked of you. It, it actually feels good to be able to drop the mask and communicate. And I think for a lot of people that's the same thing. They feel like there's, there's, their belief system is so tied into that compromise and so tied into sacrifice that even if they don't tend to adhere to a religion uh, that emphasizes sacrifice um, and certainly you know you could talk about your development you know it really wasn't through religion but you could science in different ways but but also you're now studying a pathway a course in miracles that is basically asking you to really question that belief in sacrifice that belief in lack that belief in reciprocity it's a it's the core underpinning of this entire world it's not just as some small thing. It's it's like the very fabric of this world is rest, and I might say even teeters on, on sacrifice, because it's the base, it's the bedrock of this whole world. So in that sense, it's not surprising that you or other Course in Miracles students, or even those who participate in Course in Miracles groups and study the book for months or years or decades even. Um, still would have some ambiguity around this reciprocity, around this, uh, we could say, sacrifice belief. And, you know, for me, that was very important for me to, to go deeper and deeper and really look at, you know, do I believe in sacrifice? Do I value sacrifice? And if I do value it, you know, how is this really helping me, you know? It can seem on the surface, you know, like you're saying, well, you worked hard, you saved the money, and now you're going to spend it, you know. And that's kind of a common belief. It's like, whether we're talking about currency or we're talking about time as currency, it's Jesus says, you believe that this is a band of time between birth and death, pretty much to, to use as you wish. And that's, that's the common underlying belief of this world. I've got life of my own, a mind of my own, I have resources of my own, I may have debts, but then again I've got my stash, you know, and I can, you know, be merry and have, and spend that stash any way that I want, and I'll come back to deal with the debt at some other point. And that's very, very common, that's a very common experience. It's not just with individuals, you could say you could go into countries, <laughs> you know, many, many countries that just Spend and spend and spend and spend, print a lot of money, keep printing more and more money. I'm not naming any names here, but, uh, you know, it's just bizarre, you know, if you had an individual doing that, you know, let's print more money and stimulate growth, you know, you know, it, it just keep printing, you know, there's nothing backing it, it up, you know, it, and then if you take it even deeper down, it's like, well, and what is the value of, of all these green paper strips and metal discs and all this buying and selling and spending, you know, what is the point underneath this? Is this, am I, am I supposed to get happy with this activity or something? So I think for me, that's the thing that I had to go through the same thing. You know, I had student loans as well and not a whole lot you know, in my mind, uh, but it was, it was still significant. I thought about it a lot, even though it wasn't that large of an amount. And then I felt I had to use this practice to be guided to jobs and things that would be necessary for me to pay off the debt and use it for the mind training though, not 
focus on it and say, oh, I'm going to do this job to pay down the debt only. That was going to be more of a byproduct of all the mind training that will, would take place, all the mirroring, all the mind watching, all the, you know, raising stuff up and, re and watching it and releasing it. That was the most important thing for me. And then as a byproduct, you know, that did seem to get handled. And then I just felt like that was just another step for me in clearing my, clearing away the debris, you know, in my mind and saying, okay, now use me. Use me in a truly helpful way. But that was a very important thing to face. And, but you're right on, it's, you're, you're facing a belief system, you're not facing uh, a number on a ledger somewhere. You know, it's much deeper than that. So how do you know when the, the relationship with work, or the relationship with anybody, has been maximized? When, you've, when you have learned all that you're going to learn there, and you have taught all that you're going to teach there, how do you know when that, how can you know for sure when that has happened? Yeah, that's, that's another good question, because that's really getting into discernment. Reminds me of the old Kenny Rogers song, you got to know when to hold them, <laughs> know when to fold them, <laughs> know when to walk away, know when to run. You know, it's, there's a lot of discernment in these country songs. You really have to listen, but you know, it, you really do have to know these things. And I mean, for me it was always, how do I feel? And sometimes I would get the feeling like the job was over for me. You know, like I couldn't compromise anymore, this job was over, I couldn't just go in and just go through the motions one more day, one more minute. And, and then uh, I would usually have an internal battle. What, are you crazy? You can't just leave this job. You don't have another job lined up and blah, 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 blah. You know, the internal dialogue can, can be quite strong and everything. But the deeper I went with the Course, the more I practiced the mind training, the more I did the lessons, I just, I find that it was actually more and more difficult for me to compromise. You know, you know compromise in relationships, compromise in jobs, compromise with anything. It was like a, it's like, it became like the razor's edge. It was like a razor blade. It became very, very painful to compromise in any way because I became so sensitized to the compromise. I think the whole plan of the ego is to make it make us so dull, and so bored, and so kind of depressed, and feel so weak, like we've just succumbed to something that's much bigger than we are, uh, that we just kind of give up and blindly go along and just do whatever we're told to do, or do whatever people around us tell us we're supposed to do. And and the more I work with the Course, I just thought, this is not going to work. I, if me just blindly doing what I'm supposed to do. And then I'd say the deeper, I mean, when I got into the Course deeper and deeper and deeper, I noticed that if I had any dependencies on groups or dependencies on teachers, you know, that I had, to, I was compromising still. You know, it was, if it was easier for me just to say, well, my, my Course group thinks, such and such, or so and so, that's a really well respected teacher, they teach so and so, without investigating it and exploring it myself, just to kind of say what they said, you know, there was still that temptation there. But then the more sensitized I became, I said, I can't do that either. Uh, I mean, it was difficult for me, I guess, I, I was involved and did a lot of travels to Course in Miracles groups as well, and then I just got a point, it got to a point where it was like, I, I noticed that that was all helpful, but I was being called into something deeper than, than course groups. Not to say that I wouldn't spontaneously go to any course group or any gathering anywhere where I felt a strong invitation and a strong guidance to go, but it was just, it was kind of like transcending this whole idea of group and being a member of a group and all that stuff, you know, it just felt like I just carried that out as far as I could, and then it was like, oh, I don't know what's going to come next, but I do feel like this is through. 
And that happened to me a lot. It happened to me with a lot of jobs. It happened in a lot of relationships. It happened in a lot of geographical locations. I think you and I probably have that in common, you know, that, that we are well-traveled <laughs> and we can talk about a lot of different places we've been and this and this and this, but, but it was, I did get that feeling, okay, it's time to move on. But not, it, it was a calm feeling. It, it, it wasn't a, there wasn't a push with it. There wasn't like, I have to move on, or there wasn't like, I have no other options, I have, I have to move on that way, or that I was kind of driven, you know, to go to places, see how many places I could go, or groups I could visit, or, you know, there was nothing going on. It just started to become more and more natural. It's like a very smooth, easy, intuitive feeling. And when it was time to move on, it was very clear, and when it was time to stay, uh, in the early years that was a big thing too. Sometimes I would, I would think, oh, it's kind of nice here, I like to just hang around, and oh, it's kind of, I like the people here, and the good food, and I go stay, and no, <laughs> go. Oh, okay, you know, I just, it was really practicing that over and over. And it just, just like if you were exercising a muscle, you know, you strengthen that intuitive, uh, alignment you feel. You just keep strengthening and strengthening that, and then it just gets more natural. So, um, since you don't agree to disagree, did you find that that was something, that, that you wanted to have a nice, smooth parting with the people, the job, whomever? Uh, or did you ever find that, in fact, uh, some people were just hurt and demanding and wanting you to stay and not willing to see your way, not willing to see um, your reasoning for leaving or whatever you were offering them. Um, and you had to leave anyway? Did you find yourself yeah. in those positions? I think I could say that I always saw it as a reflection of my mind. So if I was having the internal dialogue back and forth, I couldn't even be surprised that I would have conflicting witnesses. Some saying, oh, that's, you should do it, or you should go, and others saying, what are you, what are you doing? This is crazy, da da da. So, the, it was like they were always reflecting my state of mind, and, and it was only when I became very, very clear, and very, very sure, and very, very tuned in, that it's almost like I, I just didn't, I didn't put any faith in the appearances anymore. So you could say, from a worldly perspective, sometimes people would still, oh, don't go, or, oh, I don't like that decision, or, or even express that they were feeling hurt, or so on and so forth. But, but my whole interpretation, we could say, had, had changed. I, I, it was just what was given me. And so in the early years, oftentimes, I would feel very clearly a guidance, and I would just go round and round with it, you know. And then, not surprising <laughs> that the characters in the dream would seem to go round and round with it too. They were just reflecting my own doubt. So, I could, I could never pawn it off and say, oh, you know, so I, I can't do this because so-and-so doesn't want me to, or this and this and this. I had to just start to realize that if there was any sense of doubt there, that this was doubt that I had to expose and release in my mind, and, and take it off of the equation of, of persons and personalities, and really start to, you know, really come to an, an honesty about that doubt. So that was very helpful. You know, it was almost like real self-inquiry, real deep contemplation. Like, get to the root of the doubt here. What is this doubt? This isn't natural for me to have doubt. And so I would like follow it in to the root. And, and to me, that's what the whole spiritual journey has been, is getting to the root and just kind of plucking that root out. And like rooting out the doubt is really what it's all about. So what I hear you saying is you would, in the early days, you would have a, a clear inspiration and then doubt would move in and then you'd sort of roll around between those two poles 
for some time in your in your external environment in the form of maybe the people who were in your life would reflect that. Yes. And as you began to go into the doubt and look at it and root it out, um, then you s- didn't spin between these poles as long with each at each juncture, and so you could more quickly move. And the outer reflections reflected that too. Yeah. So you had fewer people who were doubting you, and fewer people who were, who se- who seemed to be arguing with you to stay or to do something else. Yeah, that's exactly how it went, and it also was very helpful because it seems like part of my function was involved public speaking, uh, so not just doing one on ones or phone counseling or whatever, but going out and doing talks and gatherings and so on and so forth, and then. It was the same dynamic, you know. Um, it, it was more for me to be there in the present moment, just in the presence, feeling the love and the presence, and then let it just pour through, regardless of what happened. Whether people were smiling, laughing, frowning, kind of sitting there with their hands, just drinking in every word, or walking out <laughs> in a huff, or whatever, you know, it became more and more irrelevant. Because it was the showing up there in the presence was everything, and what seemed to occur, you know, was was really not mine to interpret. You know, I really had to start to let go of of trying to interpret things in a personal way, because that just reinforces the doubt. You know, did I say something wrong? Did I offend you? You know, it it just you just never see that in the Bible. You go through the the Course in Miracles and the the New Testament. You don't see Jesus, have I done something to offend you? <laughs> he never says that, because there's no presence there that's concerned about offending anybody out there, because the, in the presence there really is nobody out there. It's just a unified presence, and that's what the, this is all about. Uh, who were some of your more influential teachers in the flesh? Well, it's interesting. Um, I think the ones that that just stood out the most, I know you and I have talked about uh, Peace Program before. Uh, Peace Program comes to mind initially just because of the demonstration, you know how the Course says, to teach is to demonstrate. And I could feel a vibration uh, when I would think about certain people or I would read about certain people, I could really feel them uh, in my heart. And it was just a sense of, of detachment from the world, a sense of not valuing the things of the world. And um, those kind of people are strong witnesses and symbols, I think, you know, at least they were for me. Uh, I had another friend that I met um, in New York uh, when I was going to the Foundation for A Course in Miracles, and her name was Dorothy. And I just re-met with her on Whidbey Island um, recently. Uh, she's probably in her late 70s now, but uh, that was a very p- powerful encounter because when we came together we both had a feeling that it was like a homecoming kind of feeling where we came together, we felt this beautiful sense of joy and love and connection and we both almost just spoke the same words at the same time that we are, we're not crazy. We both laughed and laughed and looked in each other's eyes and said, we are not crazy. The world is crazy, but we're not. And it was just this joy and laughter. It was a sense of recognition. So, I have to say that I've had that feeling with a number of people along the way, and that has been like a sense of a, of a deep recognition, uh, a sense of, of such a clear reflection of what I'm experiencing. Uh, with the Course, it started, I think, when I was in California, Southern California, and um, I was at a humanistic psychology convention and was going down to talk to some people, and there was a, a TV screen and there was a, 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 a video playing with a teacher named Tara Singh. And I just stood there, just probably for maybe 20 minutes or half an hour, just listening to the interview. It was actually an interview uh, with a man named Keith Berwick, and it was the show was called At One With. 
and uh, I think it was filmed in Los Angeles, and I just kind of was mesmerized just watching these two people having this dialogue, and they were talking about a lot of the things that I had been contemplating about, but had not really spoken about with another human being. That was kind of a neat experience. It was almost like, wow, the whole interview was just captivating. And then later on I met with some of his students and they said, oh yeah, out of all the videos he's done, they, they all liked that one the best. It was just, there's such a presence, open, lively dialogue and, and almost like you could feel the onion getting peeled, you know, during the whole show. Um, and so that was very, very helpful as well. And, and um, I, I had powerful experiences at Roscoe, New York, uh, with Ken Wapnick and the staff. Uh, up there, and it was a very international Course in Miracles Center. So I was just meeting people um, from other countries that were there doing translations of the Course into their native tongue. Um, it was it was very surreal. I was just I kind of went there, kind of in a very mystical state, and people would say, come, I have to take you to lunch, or I saw you in a dream and I heard this or that. It was very different than I was used to experiencing. But it was like the Spirit was just showing me, oh, this is how it will happen. You'll just have people coming to you and, and it'll be very deep, purposeful encounters. And, and this will be your life. It will just happen over and over and over again. But I'd say, just slightly before that, right around 89, 90 was when I started to have these contacts with people, including people that would just show up and say to me, I think you're to be my teacher. And that was kind of a little surprising and startling to me. I, I wasn't planning for that or looking for that. I would just kind of think, well, this must be, it's referred to in the teacher's manual <laughs> of the course, it's, this must be this phenomenon happening. I wouldn't try to figure it out or anything like that. So yeah, it's been that, and then also with a lot of the travels, I've just been felt very grateful to just be with people, um, staying with somebody. Like when I was in uh, Australia, she just said to me one day, um, "I would love for you to meet my master." And I said, "Oh, well, that sounds good," but she's very, very busy. Avatar, <laughs> you know, it's like, oh, I guess I can see that, and and she said, and I see you. You've got people coming here to do one on ones. You know, your your day is just full. Um, people are coming, 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 and she's got people with her all the time as well. And so I said, well, let's just be spontaneous. Then you just come and get me when there's an opening. If and maybe we'll just trust that. That there will be an opening that you know that will come, and then sure enough, one afternoon she said, "Get in the car, come with me." So she took me over to meet her master, Isaira, and uh, we just had a wonderful time together, laughing and just eye gazing, and we didn't speak a whole lot, but uh, it was just very deep sense of recognition and everything, and and says, "Well, maybe you invited us, Isaira, to come and do a an Easter retreat with me at a at a Buddhist center." because she was, had come from the Buddhist uh, tradition. And uh, so I thought, oh, how fun, East and West, and male and female, and Easter at a Buddhist center, you know, I love that kind of stuff. It's just so integrated, it's so all-encompassing. And, and sure enough, you know, we came together and she had devotees there, and a little, little uh, white carpet that they put under her feet, so her feet wouldn't touch the ground. and. She slid her carpet over. She said, would you like to share my carpet? I said, oh, thank you. So we both did a little footsie thing there. And, and we both, we just had a lot of fun at, up in the Blue Mountains. That's the, the Blue Mountains CDs and files that are on the internet. And it was just very, very joyful. And I just love that. It's just how the Spirit works, you know, just bringing people together. You know, we didn't have anything in common in terms of, the, of spiritual tradition. We didn't speak from the same vernacular. She used much more of an Eastern, kind of a Buddhist approach. And I was using a lot of Course in Miracles terminology and Christian terminology and everything. But it was the same love, the same oneness, the same 
joy and, and the same laughter. We had lots of laughter in that. I remember that one session we did too, one of the people that was there, that was with me the whole week, uh, Asira just came for, for Easter. And um, this Asira just started laughing, laughing, and this woman in the audience, uh, I think her name was Lynn, started laughing, laughing, and at one point she just blurted out, Stop it! I, this is hurting my cheeks, and Asira just wouldn't go for that. <laughs> Too much laughter, no. Or that thing of, it's hurting my cheeks. No, the laughter is not <laughs> what's hurting here. So it was just very, very joyful. And <laughs> that's the way that life is meant to be, you know, where it's one big collaboration, not this path versus that path, or this language or that language. And when someone has said to me, you know, I don't like that word, or stop using that word, or whatever, you know, I don't agree to disagree, I just say, well, it's just the word that was given, you know, I can't defend it or, or change it, but I do feel that joy in my heart, that connection, that's like, oh, we can join beyond the words. We, we can't reach a point where, where a word or a phrase stops us, like a wall goes up over the words. There's something much deeper that's beyond the words. And, and, and I'm always willing to really stay there with it and, and, and share and extend that experience and really share the experience that there really isn't a problem. And that to me is what, what my mission's about, is really to share that experience. And since you're not into compromise, you won't necessarily give up the word, but you won't necessarily keep it either. It's just however the communication is guiding you to flow through the language at the moment. Would yeah, that it's, that's, that's accurate. Like, I'm thinking of a time at the monastery in the chapel where I was just Sunday service was giving a talk, and and it was right in the middle of the talk, and then a man just said, "Stop, stop! Don't don't use that word." And I can't even remember now what the word was, but it was like, "Oh, well, it was just given," you know. So there wasn't a, a sense of having to hold on the word, or having to defend the word, or having to say the word, or not say the word. But you know, it was it's just something that's so deep in me that that I can see that the problem is never in the words. You know, the words never bother me. You know, people can, can use what they, they call them slang words, swear words, all kinds of words, words that I don't even know what they mean, <laughs> words in different languages or whatever. It's just that, that there's, a, there's a meaning that's deeper, that's who we are. And it, that meaning is really untouched by words. You know, the words are really kind of crude. They're kind of really crude tools. It's like you and I went out to try to clear the sage fields, you know, using a fork. It could take us a while, because uh, we would have to be really digging under the sage plants with the fork. But, but to, to me, that's in, in some ways, that's how words are. So that's why I don't put a lot of credibility and, and a lot of... Um, value in the words. It's more the, the meaning, the experience beneath the words. Thank you. Um, so, David, I would like to talk about something a little bit more personal. Sure. So, um, can you tell me how, uh, how your personal sexuality has, has um, served you as a symbol in your growth, and how has it changed? Um, I was talking yesterday, we were talking yesterday with uh, Jason about mm -hmm. this. And um, we explored how when two people come together and there's an intensity of connection, and when it's explored how um, this intensity takes can, can take on um, you know, this sort of bodily energy, we would call it turned on. Um, but that oftentimes, somewhere in the process, it's common in people's experiences that they have like a disconnect that happens. And then sort of, a, uh, they sort of journey off of this connected path into a more conditioned response about how to behave, etc. And... Um, and 
and somehow that is also rooted in all the beliefs about you know what it means to be together and what it means you know what it means to be together like to be exclusive and to act this way and to not act that way and all this kind of stuff so when we're use when we're involved in mind training and we're wanting to really deepen our minds and use sex as a symbol for that um, and be willing to have all these obstacles undone, then it seems that naturally uh, it would be reflected in the sex act somehow. Um, you know, perhaps maybe even growing to a place where there's no sex between two people. I don't know what that would be. Can you tell me, um, can you give me kind of a synopsis of like maybe starting at where you were when you hit the road mm -hmm. up to today? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think the the thing we could go back to that word communication because I think if if the Holy Spirit uses the body solely as a communication device, and that's what we learn in the course, then you might say that as you progress on the spiritual journey, and as I progressed, it was communication. I, I had a broader and broader experience of communication from the early days of just starting out, which was pretty limited, based on my beliefs at the time, what communication was, to a much more expanded experience of what communication is. And so, I guess for me, you know, I, I've talked about this before, but, but during my teen years and during my twenties, most of my twenties, I was very contemplative, and really sexuality, I, I wouldn't say I really acted out much in terms of sexuality, uh, masturbation, but not acting it out as the world would, would would say in terms of relationships. It would be more of, we would call like fantasizing, more of mental, and and the act of intercourse as being something that is a is a physical act, even though we we do learn from the course as we go deeper with it that it's all mental, that there's really no difference you know, between thinking about it, fantasizing about it, and acting it out. That applies to everything. Murder, even. <laughs> Having murderous thoughts and, and actually murdering somebody in form seem to be very, very different things. And yet, as you go deeper into spirituality, you start to realize that it's all mind. It's all an experience in consciousness. And there are no distinctions. There are no levels in that way. So for me, it started out, I would say you can't really, you can't deny uh, what seem to be urges and instincts, you know, whether it's for hunger or thirst or sex, sex drive and so on and so forth. Um, it, you can't just deny them or pretend that they're not there. Um, that's part of the human condition. And the Course is coming along and it's saying, here's what you believe, here's what you're experiencing, this is the human condition. Now join with me and go through a mind training experience, which will seem to go on for some time. It's a deep mind training experience and I'll take you, the Christ will take you beyond the human condition to a spiritual condition, to a higher state of mind, a higher state of consciousness, ultimately to the highest state of consciousness. So for me, it was, I'd say, teens and twenties, I would say that the, the David character was pretty repressed um, and pretty much into denial about a number of things. And that that opening up in the late twenties with with dating, with, you know, being involved sexually and so on and so forth, you know, that everyone seems to, or most everyone goes through these things. Uh, it was just later for me. And then the relationships that would seem to come, I felt always were very much a part of guidance, guided relationships, guided assignments. Um, I would say it, it did feel like like the sense of uh, monogamy was there, more of like an intuitive monogamy, like to try to get off into something that someone might call multiple partners or polygamy, just felt really complicating to me, in terms of mind training, intuitively. And that's, as I moved along in my life, that's what I really followed, just increasingly, intuitively, what felt helpful. 
what would increase the helpfulness, what would help me come to my goal of atonement, you know, and, and progressively, that's why I would say it was more like what the world would call like serial monogamy. Uh, monogamous relationships where there's like, you're together for a period of time, there seems to be lessons to be learned, we could almost say mutually, even though it's really a lesson in mind that we're aiming for, but it seemed that way, and then they would, uh, you would appear to separate, uh, and be told by the Course that it was maximal, that the learning was maximal, even though the ego may have judged differently and said, no, no, <laughs> that's, that did not achieve its full potential. Don't leave me this way, don't walk out on me, or, you know, or, or all those things. That was progressively more and more my experience, that, that everything was maximal, there was never any kind of random thing going on. There was never a time when one person gave more than the other, uh, or vice versa, you know, it was a much higher context. So that, I would say, went on and on, you know, progressively, and, and I think as you get into the miracle, you know, it's like, you know, in the Bible, Jesus said, you, you know, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. In the Course in Miracles, Jesus says, you know, you will perceive the flesh, or you'll recognize the spirit. He doesn't say and. He says you'll perceive the flesh, or you'll recognize the spirit. And it was very apparent as I worked with the Course deeper and deeper and deeper, that, that I was loosening from all of my thoughts and judgments and value of the five senses, of appearances, and sexuality is definitely included in that. You could talk about it in terms of your appetites and your desires for climate preferences, or food preferences, or sexual preferences, or clothing preferences, or whatever. But basically, the movement for me over the years has been one of becoming more and more and more consistently miracle-minded, and having the preferences, which let's be honest, they're judgments. There's just no other way around it. It's not like condemnations, preferences are judgments. They, they block the light from awareness, that as I just gave myself over to the miracle more and more and more and more, the preference patterns, the egoic preference patterns, started to get washed away. They were still being used, you know, there's no accidents, even food preferences, climate preferences, sexual preferences, they were made by the ego, but the Holy Spirit can use what the ego made. But we must remember that when we say that, the whole point is to, to have the mind washed free of them all. And in the end, that's, I would say, you, you everyone moves in that direction, from being whatever they label themselves, heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, whatever, into what I would call non-sexual. What is non-sexual? Well, I am not a body, I am free, I am still as God created me. That's really not a sexual concept. There's an experience there of not being a body. It's not very sexy. No, it's not <laughs> sexy. I mean, Jason and JP who put together this uh, montage uh, called The End of Time, and, and it's the encounter, it's Star Trek, the Star Trek Forger, they encounter this abstract light and at one point, they're observing this kiss, and, and the, one, the woman's kind of doing this thing, with this, what, is, what is this? And he's trying to explain pleasure. She says, what is pleasure? It was, it's such a great, uh, it's called The End of Time, but it's like in Star Trek, it's, the abstract light has, is not really romantic at all. The, the abstract light is not have, doesn't have a libido. Uh, you know, it's, and so it's kind of funny, when, you know, we have all these books like, you know, Dan Brown and, you know, whether Jesus was married or not, and, and what went on with Mary Magdalene and him, and, you know, all this fascination. But the Christ is neither male nor female, and it's, it's just not romantic. It's not to say that the Holy Spirit can't use the belief in romance to take the mind into a higher experience, because 
in this world there's a there is a swirl like you said like an energy to the romance and yet if it can go away if it can fade if it can break if it can shatter it, you know it could never have been love really it, it 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 had to have something else mixed with it if there could be this kind of heartbreak and i i love that movie uh, solaris with uh, george clooney uh, well, there's a line, there's a, a poem, poem in there, though lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion. And it's a great movie. I've sometimes said if you were on a desert island you could only have one movie to watch, that would be a great choice because that poem, I can still in Thomas, that just is throughout that movie, the lovers be lost, love shall not, and death shall have no dominion, is really loosening the mind from its identifications with the form. And when the mind's identified with the form, it's, it's like a tragedy. These, you know, the love is there and then the love is gone. Or there's something like unrequited love, where one person seems to love and the other one doesn't. And the pain of the tragedy of that, you know, these are all the the seeming variations of, of the ego's special love, and this is all about transcending that. So I would say that, that as I've gone along in my journey, in my life, you know, it's, it's, it's moved into a, a non-sexual experience. And that means that it's just like there's this, the attention, the focus has gone away from looking for uh, a certain kind of looking for anything from somebody, you know, that's part of what sexuality is, you know, it's looking for something, it's the ego's desire to get something, and this presence is nothing to do with that, you know, it's just about giving and extending. So then, what that has done, it has, has basically transformed my whole perception of relationships, because then, instead of you know, what would serve a personality self and what would, what I personally would want or what I personally would desire or the outcome that I would like to pursue in a personal way and so forth, that all just yields and gives way to what I call what serves the whole. So, for example, when I was traveling, sometimes solo, sometimes partnered up with somebody, sometimes partnered up with translators when I would go to different countries. Underneath it, it was all, the feeling was what serves the whole. It's more obvious with things like, like for instance, translation. I go to a country that I've never been to before, or I, I don't speak the language. So I may have lots of love and joy and be smiling and laughing and everything, but, but without a translator, they just say, oh, there's a happy guy. He really looks happy. You know, they even say that on television shows. You, they call in, you look very happy. But without the translator, then the stepping stones of the words just sounds like, like garbly goop, you know, without the translator. So, there's been so many instances where I've been paired up and paired up and paired up with translators. Male translators, female translators, amazing translators, where we felt a sense of instant rapport, instant connection, and then together the bodies were used in a very strong communication function, which all the faces lit up. There was lots of laughter and joy and happy smiling faces because there was a connection where the spirit was using the words, the spirit was using the forms. But you see how different that is than the ego's perspective of, you know, it's always looking to, to form interpersonal relationships. It's like, well, yeah, you've got a little connection there, that's fine, but where's that going to get you? When you're gone to the next town or the next country, you know, where does that get you? You know, when there's, if there's nobody there to hug you or kiss you or hold you or and all those kind of things, you know, the ego is thinks that that's not so good at all, you know. It just doesn't understand what that function is anyway. What serves the whole? It doesn't even believe in wholeness. 
So, you know, it's got its own agenda for everything. And it's, it's always on the lookout for getting something that it wants. And that can be with material possessions or it can be with relationships as well. So, at the, uh, the, the two guidelines that you and the messengers live by, whether on the road or at the monastery, are no, no people pleasing and no private thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, how does the no private thoughts, is that really applicable in the world where people are not in agreement about the intent of these guidelines? Well, I would say it, it has application in the mind because God didn't create private thoughts. But in terms of the world, it has to have the context of, of discernment. So it's not like, you know, people are getting out there and they're just going to just spill out and spew out <laughs> all their private thoughts and secrets, you know. You know, <coughs> it's really what is the, the purpose. So you have to have that purpose guiding everything. Everything that you think, say, and do is meant to be under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. That takes practice, of course. You know, it takes a lot of practice, and it can seem to take a long time before you make gains in that way. But it's more of like a, like a metaphysical fact, and then what's behind it is really an invitation to not try to hide and protect um, thoughts and beliefs. Because the Holy Spirit can't shine them away as long as they're being hidden and protected. So, I, to me, that's the most important thing to know about that guideline, is that there's, if there's a genuine invitation to expose and to not hide and protect, that will go a long way. That, that's a way of accelerating, uh, speeding up the, the spiritual journey, because it's just, that's one of the biggest ego defenses, is just secrecy, protection, uh, the whole mechanism of denial is really based on trying to be unaware of what's in mind. And as far as uh, people pleasing goes, is there any, um, is it possible that you might be led to say something that you know would, uh, is it possible that you would be led to say something because it it's pleasing to somebody, and that it would be spirit-guided to do so. Yeah, I think that, that underneath it, the, the words that come and that are used by the Holy Spirit are there to inspire and bless. And so, um, you could say, bring comfort, bring joy, you know, bring a sense of peace and connectedness. So, um, it wouldn't so much be to, to pleasing the people, but it would be more just kind of radiating that state of, of genuine friendliness that's there. Uh, and I think for most people they would say that friend, friends and friendliness is, is pleasing. Uh, it's grumpiness and, and attack and everything that people say that's not pleasing at all. So when we say people pleasing, it's more of like just noticing that if you're doing it out of a sense of trying to gain get approval. It's back to that getting mechanism of the ego. You're trying to get something from somebody, so you're going to say something, or do something, or act a certain way in order to get something, get a reaction even. It can be that. Um, but that getting mechanism has to be uh, exposed and released, and that's really what the people-pleasing is all about. Thank you. Um, can you tell me, um, are you still struggling with a spiritual ego? No, I, I've all, when I've seen the, those terms together, I think that's kind of funny. Um, just those two words even appearing side by side. But, um, but I know the intent behind the question. Um, but no, I don't feel anything with it. Because I, I have no desire to, to lead anybody, and I have no desire to follow anybody. Um, it, to me it's a state of mind, but it's, there's not a sense of trying to get anything. So, um, you know, like if I'm doing interviews and the, the electricity goes off, 
how I'm the, the same way. There's not, there's not even a need that, that, that words get out somewhere or people hear something. I had this discussion one time several years ago at, uh, I think it was that Blue Mountain Retreat where I was having breakfast in the morning and, and this young man just sat down and said, you know, you, you better start taking this seriously. And I was eating some cereal and I said, what? What am I taking seriously? And he said, well, you know, you, you, and he started mentioning a few other teachers, you know, you've, you have a huge responsibility to the young people on this planet. And I said, I just kept eating my cereal, and I said, I do. I don't feel that. And he said, oh, that's terrible. That's a problem right there. You should, you should feel a huge responsibility to the young people, to the planet. And I, I really don't. And he said, well, you, you know, you, and the whole talk was, you know, you have, you have a mission. And it's a very important that you complete your mission. And I said, yeah, I, I used to even believe in a mission there for a while. But I don't, and he started to get quite disturbed that I didn't even believe in a mission, and, you know, I just, I just sat there probably, he was there the whole time for a half an hour while I was having breakfast, but if, you know, that's where I, I would think you could get into what the world would call like a spiritual ego, is if you take spirituality or any aspect of spirituality serious, you know, then that's, that's a block, because there's nothing really to be taken seriously. And I think that authentic spirituality just, there's a gentleness, a lightness, a friendliness, but, but things that once seem to be so, so serious are just seem not to be that way at all. It was just a misperception. And I think that that's where, when the mind tries to bring the ego along on the spiritual journey, and whatever, make a career out of it, or whatever, you know, that's where the, the problems enter. I think too, if people would come in and they start to look around at our, get down and look at our books and this and this, they see that what I'm really about is I'm just about sharing. And I mean sharing, of course, sharing in the spiritual sense, sharing an idea, sharing a state of mind, really, that's what it's all about. But, but there's not this attempt to, to get or cling to or possess or attain to something, you know, the world says size matters. I don't think size matters. I really don't, I don't even understand what that means. It is, there's just a, a beautiful, gentle presence that, that is all that really has any meaning in my life. It, it is my life. And then um, all these other things where things seem to happen and people judge them as spiritual or not spiritual, it's just kind of even the idea of a spiritual person even sounds really strange to me, or uh, attaining spiritual enlightenment, you know, as if it's some kind of a, an event that's off in the future somewhere, that can be like that hamster wheel spinning around again, where you just think you have to do all these things, not realizing that the very thoughts about the future and the pursuit and the seeking are actually a, a defense that has to be dropped. So, to me it's, it's quite simple, but it's, uh, it's a very humble experience, and, and there's no sense of um, pizzazz to it. It's, you know, it's very, peace is very ordinary, uh, and maybe it's because it's natural. I just don't see it as like this extraordinary state of mind. I just don't have that context anymore. Thanks, David. You're welcome. All right, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> hey! hey. <laughs> um. <laughs>